It's clear capitalism doesn't work very well at the moment. Well, the reason why capitalism isn't working very well today is simply because the fact that you're strangling capitalism half to death. We know that economics isn't something black and white. We know that, you know, politics isn't like that. We know there's a scale, like I've mentioned many times before. And what capitalism is, is the separation of the economy from government. So let me start by saying that there is no such thing as crony capitalism. There's no such thing as something capitalism. There's capitalism. And capitalism is about free markets. It's about the separation of state, of government, from economics, from any involvement in business and in the marketplace. Crony capitalism, what is it? Why is it so bad? To answer these questions, let's think about good old fashioned capitalism. It is premised on the free exchange of goods or services between independent agents. Yeah, there's cronyism, crony socialism maybe, or just, let's just call it cronyism. Let's just call it, this is government involvement in the economy, the inevitable consequence of the mixed economy. You can't exist in this kind of economy, in this kind of world, without there being cronyism. The reason is that that's how we've set up our economic. That's the essence of a mixed economy. It would be an erroneous argument for anyone to say that we live under a free market today, you're living in the absence of the free market, and that is essentially what capitalism is. We have to bear in mind that capitalism isn't just one thing. There are almost as many varieties of capitalism as there are capitalist countries. There is only one capitalism, and that capitalism is the separation of the economy from government. When you're speaking about something called crony capitalism or state capitalism, that is essentially what you call a mixed economy. That's essentially what state capitalism is. It's capitalism that's being strangled to death because of socialist government intervention, because of socialist government regulations. There are American, German, Singaporean, Swedish, Danish, Korean versions of the thing. The differences include the size of the welfare state, from around 10% of GDP in Korea to over 30% in Finland. It's important to note the differences between capitalism and socialism when we talk about welfare. Capitalism is all about the voluntary exchange in the marketplace. It's all about charitable operations. In other words, capitalism is about charity. It's not about expropriating money out of individuals' hands through force. What the likes of Denmark, Sweden and Norway are, these are social market economies. Therefore, Although they're not free market economies, they comprise of what we call strong free market principles. In other words, they have strong private sectors, but they also have the high tax rates with, of course, the big welfare states. The welfare state in these countries is socialist simply because there's nothing capitalist about government coercion. When you have a government that forces in other words, expropriates money out of individuals' hands in society uh, to fund a welfare state. That's done through coercion. No one pays an income tax voluntarily. So essentially what you have with the welfare under socialism is coercion. So yes, in their mixed economy, such as these social market economies, whether you talk about Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland or Germany, all of these countries comprise of strong free market principles with strong private sectors, which is why they've been able to sustain it. But the big welfare states uh, and the high tax rates is in relation to socialism because it's done through force. Uh, that's the difference between capitalism and socialism and welfare. Capitalism has got dials and we can adjust them. Think that Sweden, that supposedly high tax addicted country, only introduced income tax in 1932, two decades after the US and nearly a century after Britain. Or remember that the US, that pro-rich place today, had a top income tax rate of 91% between 1950 and 1963 and it didn't do them much harm at all. First of all, it would be incorrect to say that these high tax rates do not harm these countries. We know that from the information of prices, prices tell us valuable information. And as I've mentioned before, a high price in the market signifies that there is a scarcity. Now, when you look at these countries, such as Norway, Sweden or Denmark, the reason for their domestic high costs across their economy, in other words, in their domestic economy, is simply because they're living with a shortage. They have what you call 
a severe lack of productivity. And the reason why they've got a severe lack of productivity is because they cannot afford to produce in their own home country. There is no finer example of this than of course the Norwegian automobile company called Kongsberg Automotive. Kongsberg Automotive only has 5% of their workforce left in Norway, whereas most of their workers are working and producing in countries such as China and Mexico. And the simple reason being is because they can't afford to produce in their home, own home country because of the high tax rates. As Thomas E. Woods Jr. of the Mises Institute goes on to say, Number one, via loopholes or outright tax evasion, those tax rates were not paid, as tax accountants can tell you. Number two, big spending programs are not evidence of prosperity. The US government could duplicate any of these programs today. Number three, left out is that when our education system was supposedly, on quote, the envy of the world, off quote, it was spending far less per capita adjusting for inflation than it does today. From the early 1970s to 2003 alone, spending per capita doubled. So the left has actually gotten its wish, though it pretends it hasn't. Meanwhile, Japan's spending one third as much per capita and with much larger class sizes vastly outperforms the US. Moreover, there is no connection between higher education spending and higher SAT scores. In fact, some of the highest scores are earned in states that spend the least on education. Washington DC, which spends the most, is dead last. Number four. The prosperity of the 1960s was fueled in good measure by the inflationary policies of the Federal Reserve. In John F. Kennedy's three years as president, M2 growth averaged about 8% per year, far higher than in the 1950s. This produces resource misallocation that can look like prosperity. This false prosperity is self-reversing. By 1970, just as Arthur Oaken, influential White House economist throughout the 1960s, was boasting that the business cycle had been tamed forever, the recession began. Americans paid for that false prosperity with a decade of inflation and stagnation. As economist Mark Thornton points out, on quote, from the beginning of 1946 to the beginning of 1965, the consumer price index increased by 71.4%, but then increased 20% by the end of the decade. From 1965, when the experiment began in earnest, to the end of 1980, the CPI increased by 176.6%. The experiment had tripled the rate of inflation experienced by consumers, off quote. What you need to understand is when you raise the tax rates on the rich and you raise the tax rates on businesses, all businesses are going to do is pass that off on to the consumer. In other words, in order to compensate for the higher tax rates, businesses will simply raise the costs of their goods and services and therefore it's basically the consumer that's paying for that through raised costs of goods and services, the raised costs of living, and that's why you saw the very high inflation. Contrary to the popular belief that a large welfare state is bad for economic growth, Finland, with a welfare state one and a half times bigger than that of the US, 30% of GDP is against a 20, has grown faster than the US, with an average annual per capita income growth rate of 2.7% for the last 40 years, against 2% in the US. Yes, but the difference between Finland and of course the United States of America is, Finland has strong economic business freedom. Finland Finland is a country that's a social market economy that comprises of strong free market principles. That's the difference. The United States of America has a private sector that's over-regulated by the government. Then there's the claim that redistributing wealth impoverishes everyone. But some of the most productive and wealthy countries in the world redistribute avidly. Before redistribution through the tax system, Germany in 2011 was a far more unequal country than the US. Germany's Gini coefficient, an indicator of income inequality, in which zero means absolute equality and one means absolute inequality, was at 0.51 higher than in the US, where it was 0.5. 
but after redistributive taxes, Germany's Gini coefficient fell to 0.29, while the US, with a far more elite-friendly tax system, saw its Gini coefficient fall to only 0.38. But again, what contradicts that is Hong Kong. This was a tiny small fishing village that turned into a thriving, booming city, one of which from 1961 to 1997 closed the wealth gap between the rich and poor proven by the Gini coefficient and it achieved that with extremely low levels of government regulation. There is what completely contradicts that very statement. South Korea, for example, has by far the lowest rate of inequality in the developed world, with a Gini coefficient of just 0.34. But this didn't come about by magic, rather because the country has lots of regulations, protecting some pretty nice things like organic farms and small shops, especially bakeries and bookshops. And it has laws that keep CEO compensation low by international standards, all this preventing the full manifestation of the inequalizing tendencies of an unfettered market. In other words, inequality is not the result of uncontrollable forces like technology or international trade. There are a lot of tools that a society can use in order to reduce it, and a lot of the wealthiest and most dynamic countries are using them very wisely indeed already. Again, Germany and of course Denmark are both social market economies with low levels of government regulation. That again contradicts that statement. Companies have done a host of nasty things to make investors happy right now, at the expense of the long term. They suppress wages, squeeze suppliers, and chuck back profit at shareholders rather than reinvesting. Between 1950 and 1970, the 100 largest US corporations retained 65% of their profits every year. But by the 2000s, they were retaining a mere 6%, vastly diminishing their own abilities to invest. There's no need to give up on capitalism. We just need to understand it a little better and stand up to arguments that bully us into accepting its worst versions. The problem with that argument, of course, is you're defining corporatism and not capitalism. Corporatism is not a form of capitalism. It's something that breeds from government intervention. And the problem with this is the fact that you're giving big corporations a competitive advantage in weighing smaller businesses down through the stronger government regulation. And that is essentially what leads to the monopolistic system that we see today. To defeat the monopolies, you open up fierce competition and consumer choice in the marketplace, and that can only be done through the free market economy. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,